Okay, hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webinar entitled Blended and Hybrid Learning, the Future of Education. My name is Kevin Hogan. I am the editor at large for eSchool News, and I am happy you are joining us today for what I know will be a very insightful and important conversation. This event is brought to you by Stride Learning Solutions. Since 2000, Stride has been a leader in strategic solutions to solve district challenges. Their flexible online and blended learning options boost modern instruction and promote lifelong student success. With an innovative platform, comprehensive digital courseware, adaptable technology and extensive support, Stride is equipped to help your school or district empower a brighter future for learners. Before we go to our conversation, I'd like to take a minute to go over some of the features of the platform that we're using for this webinar. This event is being recorded, so you don't have to worry about missing a thing. Within a few days, you'll receive an email message that contains a link to the recorded webinar, along with a PDF of the slides. If you have a question or comment for the panelists, click on the Q&A tab, which I highly encourage you to use as it really helps us guide the conversation to what you want to hear about. Also, there is a chat function that you can launch by clicking on it. Feel free to use this feature to contact someone from the eSchool News team if you have a technical question. So with these housekeeping items out of the way, let's get started with our conversation and some introductions. First, John Watson. John is the founder of the Evergreen Education Group, which for 20 years has been a leading consulting advisory firm serving school districts, state agencies, foundations, and companies in the K-12 digital learning field. John has led Evergreen's creation of both the Digital Learning Annual Conference and the Digital Learning Collaborative as well as planning and implementing the Resilient Schools Project, which, which helped districts respond to COVID-19 related instructional challenges. John writes regularly about various issues related to digital learning and is a contributing author of the Handbook of Research on K-12 online and blended learning. And next we have Rachel Goodwin. Rachel is the Senior Director of Academic Services at Stride Learning Solutions. Rachel has been part of the Stride family in a variety of roles since 2007. She was a classroom teacher and administrator in the brick and mortar setting in Chicago for over nine years. Based on her instructional and technological experience, she worked for the next nine years at the first hybrid school in Chicago, developing their special programs department, which included special education, ELL, MTSS, and Title I programming. Rachel, I think you got all of the education acronyms in on, on, that, on that position. In 2015, Rachel stepped into her role at Stride where she supports schools with teacher development and training and program implementation of various blended models to ensure high academic results. So John and Rachel, thank you so much for taking uh, the time today to share your insights. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Kevin. Well, I think I, first we, we might as well get started with it. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm really tired of talking about it, but uh, it's still with us to a certain degree. But uh, really this topic uh, is probably no other, it's the most popular one to talk about here in, in the time of COVID, right? I mean, it was two years ago, almost to the week uh, where I know that school districts uh, had shut down, they had sent their laptops if they had them home with students, uh, over spring break, fingers crossed with the the hope that, you know, in a couple of weeks, we get back and everybody could come back and, and we'll get back to normal. But it was right around this time, I think, where uh, people started to realize that this is going to be something that was going to be with us for, for much longer. And the conceptual ideas of remote learning uh, and blended learning, you know, topics that I know at, at conferences like DLAC and, and ISTE were always kind of out there in the ether, but um, all of a sudden, it turned into the world's greatest beta test, right? John, maybe you could start us off talking about your realization when um, you know, these ideas and concepts that you've obviously uh, been dealing with for years really met the, uh, the test that I, I'm assuming you never thought would have to meet. <laughs> uh, so a couple of things, Kevin. First of all, uh, the, the pandemic got very real for me when uh, the Colorado governor shut down the ski hills in Colorado. You, <laughs> you, know, you know when that's happening, that, 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 that's, that, that's serious. Uh, the, the other thing is, over the years, I've said a lot of things that turned out to be very wrong. Uh, but, but I actually gave an interview around that time uh, in, in which I said, 
it appears that we may be about to embark on the biggest unplanned experiment maybe in education history. And that one has uh, aged fairly well. Uh, yeah, you were spot on that, with that. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's what happened. That, that's what happened. You know, it was, it was very interesting to me though, because in, in that interview, I remember the interview, and this is a, this is a national uh, outlet. So it, uh, it, it was somebody who you would think would know. And, and the, one of the questions they put to me was, do the schools have the tools to, to connect, you know, do, do, it wasn't even that, let me, let me rephrase that. It was, do, this, do the tools exist? And it was so telling to me that in, at that point, the year 2020, I was getting an, a, a question of, is this even possible? With, with no realization that hundreds of thousands of students were accessing full-time online education, millions of students pre-pandemic were uh, taking online courses. And so what we've seen over the last couple of years on the positive side, I would say, is an increasing realization that, yes, online and hybrid learning can happen. They can be done well. Uh, unfortunately, we've also certainly seen some of the negative sides uh, when it hasn't been uh, implemented well. And then that conflation of emergency remote learning and well-planned, well-implemented online and hybrid learning. And, and I think that's been an, an issue for our field over the last couple of years. Yeah. Now, Rachel, you're, you've you been involved with this before. It was cool. Uh, going back uh, several years and, and quite an innovator in terms of the use of these technologies. Uh, I'll assume you never anticipated uh, a global pandemic being uh, one of the applications that you'd have to deal with. But talk about your experiences at that point where it really seemed like, you know, this is the moment. <laughs> Um, when we were working more than four hour, 40 hours a week, right? Because <laughs> we had a lot of uh, districts to support. I mean, mostly, I think a lot of uh, districts and even teachers, like administrators and teachers were concerned. They're like, oh my gosh, I have to learn all these new skills. I have to apply them in this new environment. I have to forget about what I did that was good, right, that was effective in the classroom. And so it was interesting when having those conversations in, in the training or even in the planning stages was letting them know, like, what worked well? How did you connect with your students, right? What are some things that you did when you were, when you have a new program and you had to onboard them, you know, onboard the, the different stakeholders to communicate with them? Let's talk about what worked with your community of learners and how do we then transfer that over into that virtual environment? Um, so it was interesting for them to say, oh, wait, this does, you know, I, I don't have to lose everything. I don't have to throw everything out, you know, to the garbage. I can actually take some of those and build on. And I told them, this is really great because now you are building your toolbox. And some of the things that you're actually doing virtually, there might, if you go back into the classroom, you could actually transfer that because it, you found it to be effective back into the classroom. So having them, you know, coming to that realization that this is, Yes, it might be different. Yes, there might be tools you're not, you know, you have to learn um, and skills you have to develop, but that doesn't mean you're starting from the beginning, right? You're not a freshman <laughs> in, in the, whole, um, the whole transition. So, you know, it, again, like I said, it was at that moment, um, there was just a lot of apprehension, anxiety. So we had to work through that uh, for them to embrace, like this is something that's, you know, we have to embrace it. We need to think about what we need to do that's good for our kids um, and get them engaged and, and, and know that the love of learning doesn't stop just because the medium or the platform that we deliver, it changes. Yeah, and it seems to me that one of the, um, you know, of, of a million disruptions uh, and maybe some silver lines coming out of it, to, to your point, Rachel, is the idea of professional development. I mean, I've written about implementing technologies in the schools for, for a long time. Up until the past couple of years, we would still have articles that were trying to make the argument for the use of the technology, uh, where you had a lot of faculty and some administration that were still resistant for the use of them. Now they had to use it whether they liked it or not. Uh, but it seems it, for the most part that we've kind of conquered at least a base level of the, the acceptance of technology and the communication from a remote uh, or at least a hybrid setting, right? Talk a little bit about what you see in terms of the general um, acceptance of these technologies versus maybe five years ago, Rachel. Sure. Um, 
I think first off, they're seeing the power of, of being able to connect with their students. And um, I would also say, I think they all struggled at some point in their, when they're in the brick and mortar, just differentiation, right? Like how do we, how do we address and how do we work with all these different academic levels in our classroom? And so when we were able to show the tools and the platforms that they could have access to, to be able to address that challenge, I think that's when they start embracing the power of the technology, right? And the, the immediacy of the feedback and data that they have access to so that they can make those data-driven decisions, those instructional decisions that really are gonna have a powerful impact on their students. And so I think when they start seeing that and how that all can work to their benefit, as well as to the benefit of the student, again, I think that's where you start seeing them being um, more accepting of the technology and wanting to learn how they can actually incorporate that in their, you know, in their delivery of instruction. Yeah, John, does that resonate? No, no doubt. And and I want to go back to something else that Rachel said in her earlier answer. She she started with the ideas around communication and, and engagement with students. And I and I think first of all, that's that's so powerful in our current context. In, in any context, I also feel like we saw that I, we saw a very quick, relatively quick evolution in the early days of, of the pandemic, because I feel like in those very early days, some of the questions that were floating around were things like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about state assessments? And that seemed to morph into, how are we teaching this particular algebra standard? And pretty quickly into the credit of the mainstream educators who had to figure this out, I think they realized they needed to communicate with students, they needed to engage with students as well. And it's something that the experience online educators had known for years, but I also think it's a valuable reminder. The, the starting point is that communication. The starting point is that engagement. The, the way a good teacher in a physical school may stand at the door of her classroom as students are coming in. You know, you, you don't start by saying, by, by jumping necessarily into that very detailed standard. You start by, hey, how, how are you doing? How was your weekend? How, how, was, how was the game? How was the dance? How was the how, how was the performance? And then you get into the academic standards. And, and it was something that uh, I, I think we, we had to address very early on in the pandemic. And I, and I think that did happen and successfully. And I think it was, I, I think a lot of the mainstream uh, schools should be commended for the fact that, that they saw that and were able to do that. I'm glad you Absolutely. brought that up. I'm Go so ahead. sorry. I, just, I mean, it just no. triggered something in me when John said that. And that's something... <laughs> You know, I used to tell when I was talking to teachers, I'm like, you need to minimize that relationship divide just because yeah. you're not right in front of them, right? That doesn't mean that all of a sudden there should be a gap of you connecting and creating that culture and the connectiveness um, with, you know, with all stakeholders, with the parents and, you know, with the students, because that connectiveness, you know, really promotes that positivity as well as the perseverance. So when challenges to come up and you have that connection with those, with your teacher, with your guidance counselor, with whoever, I feel like then the students, when they were in that remote environment, if they had a very positive connection, were able to go through those challenges and many times build new skills that only benefited them in the work, you know, as they grow older and go into the workforce or go into college and so forth. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, there, there's almost a, an odd intimacy that's created, you know, using this platform that we're using right now uh, at that time as a parent, where I spoke more to my kids' teachers uh, in 18 months than I had in 18 years. I mean, we'd have one-to-one -one Zoom calls, you know, I mean, this is beyond the instruction, but just we also talked about the idea of social emotional learning came to the forefront because, mm -hmm. as you said, John, those those first few weeks, people are like state standards. We just want to make sure everybody's okay, right? And you just want to make sure that people are safe. And um, that whole idea of SEL kind of came to the forefront. Another one of those education concepts uh, that became a, a stark reality. Talk a little bit about how you think we will be able to maintain that dynamic now that we're going back to normal or you know, whatever normal is going to be now. Can do you, do you see that these techniques uh, are something that, that are going to stick? John, I'll start with you on that. One, uh, I, I always hesitate to talk about a, a silver lining in a 
pandemic that's uh, killed close to a million Americans and countless others overseas. Uh, the, there, there is, however, I, I think a benefit to the fact that there's now more appreciation for mental health broadly. I think there's more appreciation for the needs of, of, of human connectedness, whether it's in education or outside. And within education, I, I think that's reflected in that catch-all SEL term. The, the thing that's interesting to me about SEL is when, when you dig into it, especially if you're relatively new to it, and, and I was not too long ago, right? And, and, and as I dug into it, my thought was, this is what good teachers have been doing forever, right? This is what my good teachers did in, in the previous century when I was a student. Uh, <laughs> the difference is that when you think about SEL a, as a thing, to me, it's about systematizing those issues. So you're not, you're not leaving it up to individual teachers who may have different comfort levels. They may, with, with, with thinking about SEL related issues, they may have different skills and different tactics about how to approach those issues. And so to me, a lot of this is about making sure we're taking SEL and thinking about how, how do we make it a part, a regular part of the educational experience for every student, as opposed to something that's a lot more hit or miss. I'd have to agree with you, John. That's one of the things that I think there was always such a focus like, back to MTSS, right? Just, you know, multi-tiered uh, approaches uh, and interventions to supporting students academically. And as, you know, more schools were going, were in this, in the pandemic and having to come up with, you know, remote learning and blended learning, we started having more discussions on MTSS E, which is MTSS engagement, right? What are the intervent? What are some of those triggers? What are some things that we need to be looking for? Um, what are some of those uh, strategies or skills we need to develop in our students, right? Um, to be able to manage through those challenging times and where do they get resources, even within their community, um, within the school community, outside their school community, and then looking at those interventions and strategies with the teachers. So almost formalizing, right, a process on how we address these things, but also what are the triggers, what are the behaviors, we're, you know, that we're seeing, what are the resources and supports to be able to address those things, um, and then just taking a little closer look. Um, so like, for example, with one school I worked with, they were doing a great job of tracking, actually, you know, how many times, let's say, a student might have you know, miss looking at absences, for instance, right? They were tracking absences, so those that are not uh, engaging, you know, in the synchronous sessions, um, even if it was a connect call, how many of those were missed? And looking at all of that, those data to be able to really, those are just obviously, you know, just data points, but then using that data points to ask some more qualitative questions to the student or to the families to then understand what the narrative is, right? Because they might not be able to do anything to academically because of maybe some social emotional issues going on or challenges. So how do we, how do we address that so that we can't get to the academics and to the learning? Um, so I just thought that was really interesting how we've shifted with in this you know, environment that it was just MTSS academics to now how do we take that approach when we're looking at engagement and supporting students, you know, emotionally and socially. Yeah. And to your point, uh, sorry, Kevin, is it okay if I if I follow up on? Uh, Absolutely, please. <laughs> Rachel and I are going to have a discussion here. If that's okay, I'll be right. I'll be back about uh, two fifty. No, please. So, so, Rachel, as you were talking, I, I was thinking about the fact that a lot of students, especially when you think about some of the uh, social and emotional issues. A lot of students are more comfortable in a digital environment, having these discussions, and it's not hard to to imagine those situations uh, where a student it, it may be more comfortable sharing. Maybe because it feels more one on one, or maybe just because students are 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 very comfortable in the online environment. Uh, quick story out of post secondary. My wife's a professor, uh, and. and uh, she started teaching her first online course. It was pre-pandemic. It was about five years ago. And in her, uh, and, and like a, a lot of professors and teachers, she was skeptical at first. And I still remember she, she ran her first online course and she, and 
uh, we were talking about it. And she said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have every student post a video about themselves. I, I'm just having them uh, just one to two, I did one to two minutes, nothing fancy, recorded on, on your phone or whatever. Tell me who you a little bit about you and why you're taking this course. A week later, she came back to me and she said, I am totally blown away by what these students are telling me and their peers. And she was saying that, first of all, I don't have the opportunity to do this in my, in my class, in my face-to-face -face class. And she said, and even if I did, I can't imagine these students standing up and saying that in a class, but they will record it about themselves. And, and it's, and it's just, it, to me, it's an element of how, uh, those of my age are completely uncomfortable with the idea that I'm going to record that. I, I'd be much more comfortable saying it in a room in part because I'm like, well, then I can always deny I said it if nobody <laughs> takes it, right? Uh, uh, but, uh, but then uh, the students are, are very, very comfortable in that medium. So this sticks, this, this idea of uh, almost like outside of the classroom, you have remote or hybrid dynamics that maybe aren't classroom instruction per se, because I would say as a parent, I watch both of my sons with their hoodies in bed with 25 other people on the Zoom and one teacher. I don't think that that is a particular innovation that, that will stick going forward, but having conversations with counselors, having conversations with teachers, um, uh, parents having conversations and uh, with, with teachers and even the, the two back to school nights were pretty good via Zoom versus in person. Um, you both will say that this is something you, you think should and will stick. Definitely. Yes, and I also want to allude to, Kevin, what you just mentioned about the idea of, of your kids there in a room with 25 other students and, and presumably a, a, maybe a teacher lecturing. The, and Rachel mentioned this earlier, you know, that there were aspects, especially uh, in the in the early days of emergence remote learning. And, and honestly, I think sometimes they extended uh, too long where, where what, what mainstream schools were trying to do was take a classroom environment and turn it into a Zoom environment. And, and, and that's, that's not best practice. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> arguably, it's not even good practice. And now, I, I understand why they were doing it. it. It was hard to do otherwise. It took a lot of, uh, it took a lot of uh, uh, professional learning for teachers. It took a lot of support. It was hard to do uh, on short notice. Uh, but I, w we know that there's, we, the collective field understands that there's better ways to reach students in much more engaging ways than trying to replicate uh, a lecture and, and having students just listening to a teacher for four or five hours a day. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So when you, um, when you take a look at the models that have kind of emerged from this, or at least from, from my perspective in, in my conversations, uh, it seems that the division between what remote is and what hybrid is, is on the idea that districts will now provide a virtual e academy for students who, John, as you said, who seem to perform better in this environment, whether it's because of, of learning differences or other, otherwise. Um, from both of your experiences, and Rachel, I'll start with you on this one. So as you look around school districts for the past two years, do you see an emphasis on that virtual academy model versus a hybrid model? And maybe talk about what does hybrid even mean now um, after this transition over the past few years? Sure. What I've seen, um, I've seen a lot more, you're correct, when you look at the continuum, right, of because of how you define blended, what exactly everyone kind of has their own connotation for that. But if you look at the continuum to fully virtual, to in-class use of incorporating technology, for instance, which one would call blended. So I'm seeing more of the virtual, um, but then also just more in being a little innovative with the hybrid. So you have some individual or some districts that went fully virtual, but they want to incorporate uh, learning center, so to speak, right? An opportunity for students, if they want to, be able to come into a physical building and be able to connect with their you know, with their peers or be part of clubs and activities. They want to not for it to be virtual. So offering that learning center or that physical space where they're able to come together um, and be able to participate in those type of activities. So I'm seeing more of those two particular models. When you're looking at high school, um, because it 
I mean, learning loss is a big one, right? Everyone's, that's one of the latest topics that's being talked about. And so for, especially for high school, when you're looking at learning loss, a lot of them are also looking at what we call the flex model, where you have students coming in for a certain amount of day, almost like a pod type of experience or coming in for a physical space for, for let's say in the morning and then in the afternoon, they're doing all of their asynchronous work. And when they're physically with the teachers or with a academic um, director, instructor, it's really focusing on remediation or enrichment. So the coursework, so to speak, is done more asynchronously and more of that individual uh, support is happening in that physical building. Um, and also I'm seeing a lot of like the passport model where students are coming um, again, they're working virtually for a majority of the time, but then having that center time where they're working with certified teachers with the focus of career counseling and career readiness, mentoring, social services, tutoring, and those type of those type of services happening within that physical space. Um, so I'm seeing those those three types of models more and more um, as we're discussing things with districts and, and planning for implementation and so forth. Wow, that's really interesting, especially through the passport model, something that I think we could dive in deeper to. Uh, John, how about with you, your experiences of the, the idea of the virtual academy versus other models like the passport model that, that Rachel suggested? I, I, I'm writing down the passport model. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so a couple of things. Uh, we we at Evergreen have been tracking the number of students in full time fully online schools uh, for 15 years or so, and it's pretty clear that uh, no more pre pandemic the the number the percentage of students even in the states that had these schools for a long time it was only about two percent of students that were interested students and families interested in in, in a fully online school. Post pandemic, maybe that's up to 3% in some states. Point being, a lot of students want some access to some physical space, exactly like Rachel is talking about that, that learning center and for all the reasons that she's talking about. So what we're seeing is now we're tracking the number of districts that are starting what they may be calling an online school or virtual academy. Most of these are for their own students and most of them do actually have a learning center and I'm comfortable in predicting that those that don't have a learning center right now or a physical space, if they're still around in three years, they will, in the vast majority at least, because the, the benefit to having some time with face-to-face -face is, is really valuable. Now, that may be very, very limited. They may be doing the large majority of their work online, separated uh, at a distance from teachers and other students, but having that ability to meet face to face from time to time, at least for some students, I think is a, it's a much more scalable model. It's going to be of interest to a, a much larger percentage of students and families. That is a uh, a bold prediction. I know this is being recorded, John. So we're going to come back to you in, in a couple of years <laughs> to see that. But uh, the, the learning center certainly does seem to be something that has again. These are conversations that, that we would have when you talked about uh, issues involving digital equity and uh, addressing the needs of underserved communities, uh, where, again, the concepts became a stark reality where children needed to stay at home with their siblings um, and, and watch them. And it, it broke up the dynamic how of traditional schooling. And maybe it was for the, the better now, right? I mean, um, but let's let's talk a little bit about that digital equity piece of this. Um, again, before pandemic, everyone knew that there was an issue. It was kind of a, um, a theoretical one. Getting technology into the hands of students and their ability to work remotely became a, a, another raw reality. Um, talk a little bit about how you see these remote and hybrid models helping underserved communities and addressing some of the, the, the digital accessibility and some of the digital equity issues that are obviously still pretty uh, glaring. And Rachel, maybe we'll start with you. Well, I think first off, you know, I even look, I'm gonna take it back just before even looking at the devices, right? Of how we need to make sure we get devices to those students um, because we also have to consider 
getting those devices to the students, but then making sure that they're able to keep the devices in their environment. I mean, just the honest truth, right? Things being shared, lost, like how do we always can make sure that they're always gonna have access to that online um, experience through the curriculum, but they need the device, right? So it was working with a lot of districts of, you know, luckily one of the things that Stride does is that we do lease we do lease, um, you know, computers and laptops. So that was one way for us to help our districts who couldn't be able to get, you know, devices to all of their families, you know, rapidly. We were able to, you know, provide that um, as well. And then just working with them on what's that process going to look like? How are we going to get the these process these devices into our students' hands and making sure that they are able to use it to access their work? And so working through, you know, we. Obviously, Stride has a, a division where they manage schools, so working with them to find out what are those best practices, what are some policies, what are some procedures. Um, also, having them connect as well. Like in Indiana, I did work with one uh, district in making sure that within that particular community, Verizon was their main, uh, you know, internet provider. Uh, and so we worked with them to get uh, discounted and even free internet to the families so that they can make sure that they're able to, again, you know, access the curriculum and engage in, you know, in the sessions with their teachers. And then we also, I worked with their community liaison in ways that we could get devices donated as well, because it was just a community that, you know, at that point did not have the monetary um, monies available and funds available to be able to get the, you know, what they needed to their kids as rapidly as they needed to, right? So you have to be creative sometimes, right? Sometimes you have to really kind of take grassroots in a sense, right? Where you're going out and you're trying to figure out how we can get these uh, necessary items to our students so that they are able to participate in the particular learning environment that they have been placed in. Yeah, there have been so many just downright heroic stories of districts and in their initial responses and their continued response in terms of just getting into a school bus and driving around and handing out hotspots, right? And handing out devices uh, just, just to, to make things happen. Uh, John, talk a little bit about how you see uh, these models maybe helping address uh, equity issues. Uh, so Kevin, let me first say that we, um, the, this is an area that, the, that all of our field, including the work that we do, needs to remain very, very focused on. And, and historically, I feel that we haven't done as good a job as we need to. And, and I put my own organization right in there. We, we, we need to attract a wider range uh, of, of people, serve a wider uh, range of students as well. The, when, when you think about uh, the access issues, uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, there's the device aspect. I think the device aspect uh, got a lot better during the pandemic because it's relatively easy uh, conceptually and in practice to use a bunch of money to buy a bunch of devices and get them in students' hands. And, and, and that I, I think has gotten uh, better in a material way. Internet access uh, remains uh, certainly a, a challenge in, in, some, uh, in some places for sure. And, and I think it's underappreciated the extent to which that's true in urban areas as much as rural areas. I think the fallback is always, oh, that little mountain town in Colorado doesn't have good internet access. Well, that's that's true, but but I recall reading in, in the early days of the pandemic, a really in-depth article somewhere like the Washington Post look at, looking at the kids, looking at students in, in inner city just Detroit versus somewhere like Gross Point and the differences there. The but, but I want to, at the risk of going too deep into the weeds, I, I, I want to try to make a larger point here, which is Rachel earlier talked about the distinction between some of the online and hybrid modalities that we're talking about versus ed tech. Ed tech is incredibly valuable in, in all sorts of ways. And ed tech tends to get applied at a full school or full district level, or at least most of that school or district, right? And so if you're thinking about ed tech, if you're thinking about something like, let's say district going one-to-one, -one, you absolutely have to be thinking about those equity issues for every single student. Now, when you're thinking about something like hybrid, in my view, what you're talking about is creating an option for students in your district so that they are gonna have the option to attend 
a hybrid school. So they're going to get all those benefits. They're going to have all that flexibility. Of course, equity issues there are still front and center. But conceptually, it's a little bit easier to say, okay, we think that 5% of our students, 10% of our students are, are going to choose this hybrid school. Now we can start to focus on those students at a different level because clearly the need for a device that always works for internet access that's always available is critical, but it's also more addressable because you're looking at stu at a small at a subset of students. Now I also want to be clear, it's so critically important that you not create this de facto inequitable situation by saying, hey, anybody can choose our hybrid school. But then if you're not actually supporting that access, you're not actually making it available to everybody, right? I, I hope that distinction I'm trying to make is clear. A, as a district, if you're gonna create that option, and I, and I hope districts will, and we're seeing them creating that, you do have to create those extra supports for the students who may not have that access. But I think, I think conceptually it's easier because you're talking about a subset of students. And I do think that it's really important to think about hybrid and online as options that should be available to all students as opposed to something that all students must or should be taking part in. So let's let's stay in the weeds a little bit here and, and talk about some of the particulars. So, you know, if you are a, um, a curriculum director in a district or and you, maybe you're sitting next to your technology director in a district and, and you're watching the show, what are some tips you would have for them to manage different instructional instructional needs of students um, using these techniques? I mean, can you point to some particular, maybe kind of day-to-day -day examples of, of making the switch or, or incorporating these techniques? I'll, Rich, I'll put you in the hot seat first on that one. I need a moment here. I don't know if time to go over. I love There's how some... I raise, I love, Rachel, I'm loving this. I raise the hard issues. <laughs> and then Kevin's trying to be fair, so he brings you in, but you get the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I probably will add more after my initial response, after, after John responds as well. But, you know, if you're in that seat where you're the director working alongside with that technology person, I think you still need to bring someone else to that table in that conversation. And that conversation is, you know, in some cases, it might be, uh, you know, someone from the, the parent organization, right? The parent uh, liaison, having them be part of that conversation, um, you know, or it might be going to your guidance counselor. I think you need more than just those two individuals to talk about what do we need to do for students to make sure we're equitable? Because those folks are gonna come in with a different perspective or maybe different experiences that's gonna help um, identify where the challenges are, where the gaps are maybe in resources, and then coming up with a plan on how to address those. That's my initial response. Um, I know more will probably come up as, as John talks, but that's, that's just something I think it, I really hold dear. Sometimes we need to really think who's at the table having these conversations as we're coming to a plan on how to address these issues. Well, yeah, I mean, that points to yet another disruption that maybe some good will come out of it, which is the inclusion of the wider community. When you have parents suddenly became teaching assistants, right, uh, mm -hmm. two years ago, uh, and have a much more in-depth uh, experience of what their children are experiencing, uh, not only remotely, but now going back in. John, talk a little bit about that in terms of the, the, the community aspect that Rachel was pointing to is some of the first steps to what you have to do is create a new culture, right? The, the cultural aspects are, are key. And, and I think th this discussion goes back to a, a point that, uh, that Rachel was, was making, again, about that distinction between what are you trying to do as a district that's gonna to touch all of your students versus what are you trying to do that's creating options for the students and family who choose those things. So back to your earlier question. If, if, if I'm part of a cabinet level discussion, let me preface this by saying, look, there's what, 13,000 districts in the country. You, 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 can't, you can't say, look, this is what's happening and it applies to everybody. But let's, let's just, let's, let's simplify. We're talking, let, let's say we're talking about a, a 50 to 75,000 student district. And you're talking, and you're having a, a cabinet level discussion in that district. The way I would be framing that discussion is 
there's two paths around this discussion. One path is what new options are we creating so that every student feels like there's a school for them in our district? And what that says to me is we're of course gonna have our mainstream traditional schools where extracurriculars and sports and, and, and music and all those things are, are really important. We're going through a traditional bell schedule, all those things. That's serving a lot of students really, really well. In those schools, we wanna think about how do we use technology as, re and Rachel referred to this earlier around things like data-driven instruction. What can we be adding so that teachers in that school are able to differentiate instruction to make sure that every student in those classes uh, is able to, to feel like the instruction is reaching them, right? The second piece is how do we create a set of one or more schools that are speaking to the needs of the students who don't feel well served and the families who are looking for something different. And to me, that is the, that, that's where online and hybrid come in because now you're serving the students, high school students who may wanna be in an early college program. They're pursuing an internship or a job that doesn't allow them to easily be in a school from eight to three every day. They're pursuing something like dance or arts or sports or something at a level that, that they're putting more time into such that again, that, that traditional schedule is difficult. The students, I, I know of a number of elementary age, families with elementary age kids that loved that during the pandemic, loved the time, the extra time they had with their kids. And so we see these types of families using hybrid elementary schools because they wanna be more involved. Then you've got the students who may have a, a, a physical health issue that makes it difficult to be in school on, on a regular schedule. So again, to go back to the, this vision, this idea of what, what's, the, what's the cabinet level uh, of this district discussing, they're discussing these two different paths, options, for the students and families who want it. And then the technology enhancements for all the students in the district. And there's equity aspects to both of those. And one thing I wanna add John too, to John's statement is when you're at the cabinet level and you're looking at all these different options and especially when you're looking at virtual or blended or hybrid type of approach to have a flexible mindset right, to be able to see what is working, you know, what are, what are the, what intentionally, what are the competencies, right, what are the out, out, outcomes you're trying to, first of all, competencies you're trying to develop, outcomes that you're trying to measure, and then that way it will allow us to really reflect critically on what's working and being able to re replicate that or tweak, you know, depending on the community that we're serving, but then also be having the ability to abandon what's not working. Um, and I just bring that because when you're looking at, that's what I love about virtual learning is because of that flexibility, right? Being able to, you're able to respond, to, especially when it comes to data and seeing this is not working, I can pivot. I can pivot quite easily, um, I find, when you're in that virtual blended type hybrid environment. And so I just wanted to add that piece. I think the mindset as well as you're engaging in those conversations are really important. I totally agree with that. And, 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 and Kevin, also back to your community question, if you're creating options and, and, and truly holding them up for the community, for students and families as, look, we have all these options, you are inherently responding to the community because you're going to see where, where are they choosing to go within the district. We're talking about within right now. And, and clearly charter schools are, are a very important part of the educational system. But right now we're talking about within a district, you are inherently being responsive to the community if you're creating these different options. And then within hybrid, you've got community uh, aspects as well, because we've done a lot looking at uh, college readiness and CTE within hybrid programs. And I know Stride has done a lot with this, uh, that it, it really allows students and, and school districts to think about how are we connecting with the business community? How are we connecting with the companies and what their workforce needs are? And the other thing that we've seen around this is, this is how you really get students engaged too. Because it, in my experience, talking with students, the number one way they get engaged, and, I, and I'm especially thinking about high school students right now, but the number one way they get engaged is when they see their future and their interests and they know that's what they are working mm -hmm. towards. 
None of those students ever say, why am I doing this? They, they know they're doing it because they have their path in mind. And quick story about this. Years ago, I was, I was chatting with a student at one of these hybrid schools who, who was in this very situation. She was, in, she was taking some college, high school student, hybrid school, taking some college courses, knew what she wanted to, to study in college, had an internship. And I said to her, okay, so I, I get why, why the classes that you need for this, why, those, why you're motivated for those. But how is this motivating you to study these other classes? And I just chose some that were outside her field of interest. And she looked at me like I may have been the dullest person on the planet because she's like, I need them to graduate. <laughs> and it, it, nobody needed to tell that student, hey, you got to study this in order to graduate. She knew it because she's engaged. She's, she's got her future dialed in. And nobody needs to tell her that you need to study these other things. She knew that because she knew what she needed to do to, to take the next step. Yeah. So what I'm gleaning from this conversation, when we go back and we talk about remote models and, and hybrid models, it, there's not going to be a, a piece of technology, a piece of software or a particular platform to implement these things. It's more of implementing a mindset of how to use maybe some of the technologies you might already have um, in continuing ways in which, which you had to do during the pandemic, but now have the opportunity to kind of implement. So it's almost kind of like a, a supplement to, to things that you already have. Does that make sense, Rachel? <laughs> or, or does it not make sense? <laughs> um, yes and no. I mean, I think, you know, even though when you're going to incorporate to any type of technology in your instructional planning or as resources for your teachers, you still have to be evaluating, looking at it with a critical eye as well, right? Because not every technology is going to meet all the needs of the students, right? So you have to understand what are the needs of, of your teachers and of your students to determine what's the right technology for my community of learners? Um, you know, you can't, it's just like, you know, not everyone's going to be driving a huge truck, right? It's not going to, if you live, work, or live in the city or like New York and you have very limited parking, you're not going to buy a truck, right? I know that's a very simple analogy, but what I'm trying to say is that you have to really look and be critical on what is it that, you know, having a rubric, knowing what your, what your student experience is, what's your academic outcomes that you need, um, what is it that the level of, you know, of support that that particular technology is going to be able to provide, even the training piece for your teachers, those are all different pieces when you're trying to identify who's the, what's the right product or the right technology to incorporate into the instructional, you know, program or plan, because the worst thing you can do is in, incorporate something and it's not being used at all, right? Number one, or number two, you use it. And then because you didn't take the time to, to evaluate um, it and also have conversations like this with folks that are using it, then um, you don't wanna start something, train the teachers and then put something else in their hands to do because that just causes confusion. It also causes teachers to just say, you know what? I'm just gonna go back to some old ways of doing things, right? Because I'm constantly getting something new in my hands to be able to work with my students. And it's not really, it's, it's being more of a hindrance and a challenge to be able to meet where I need to, or my goals that I'm trying to achieve with my kids, then if you have the right technology and the right tools um, to support your kids. I love what Rachel just said, and I'm gonna build on the truck analogy. And I just thought of this. So I hope I can explain this in a way that makes sense. I'm not a car guy, I'm not a truck guy. I don't really care about my vehicle, except I live in Colorado and I care about where I can get. And where do I wanna get? I wanna to get to some remote trailheads to hike in those places. And so we have a pretty beefy four wheel drive truck. The only reason that we have it is to get to those places. And to give you a sense of my level of how much I appreciate this truck, whenever I have to put it into four wheel low, I have to look over at my wife to remind me how to do that. <laughs> so I don't talk about my truck. I don't really care. I care about getting to those places. Now, the analogy I'm trying to, to, to draw is you never want to start with talking about the technology. Oh my gosh, this technology is so great. It, at one level, that's not at all what you're thinking about. And students, by the way, never talk about it. They, they talk about the relationships with teachers and counselors and folks like that. But having said that, if you don't have the right technology, 
you're not going to get to the place you want to go in the same way that if we try to take our passenger car to those remote trailheads, we're not going to get there either. So, so the technology is both not what you lead with, but you need to understand what you need in order to implement, especially as you're going online or hybrid, where the technology becomes absolutely mission critical. I love the, I love the analogy, the truck analogy. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, Believe it or not, we're actually approaching the top of the hour, and I knew the toughest part of my job this afternoon would be to keep us within uh, the 60 minutes that we have here for, for the, the webinar. We could go on for, for quite a while, but as we wrap up, I kind of want to get um, some of your final forward thinking uh, on where we're going with this. Well, I've got, John, I have you locked in for learning centers, um, but maybe we'll start with you and talk. We're when you look at the horizon, as we get back to whatever, you know, our new normal is using these hybrid and remote models in schools, um, give us a little bit of a prediction of, you know, maybe three to five years out, if uh, all things go well, the funding that has been promised and that has started has been distributed. Uh, districts have been able to continue to, um, change their culture to enable these sort of things. Where, where are we going to be? Your statement, if all goes well, is doing a lot of load bearing in that sentence. <laughs> so, so I, I want to be very clear that this isn't a, a, a prediction as much as a, a, a hope if all things go well. Look, if all things go well, we are at this inflection point because, uh, because the, the vast majority of students, families, teachers experienced some flavor of remote learning for the first time during the pandemic, and enough of them had a good experience at least to open their eyes about the possibilities. If all those things that you mentioned, Kevin, if all those things go well, what I would love to see is a flourishing of new opportunities that, again, do include charter schools, but many more of them are embedded within districts because, because students, families still look at their neighborhood school, their district of residence, that's where they expect to get their education. And there's value in that. And there's value in those districts offer it, may, having these different opportunities available. So again, this, this, is, this is in no way trying to preclude mainstream traditional schools. Th those serve a lot of students very, very well. But if things go well, what I'm hopeful that we'll see in three years is that the majority of districts have these options available so that a student of any age of a wide variety of interests can say, yeah, I want the mainstream school or no, I want this different type of school that lets me focus on these different things and I'm no longer locked into having to be at that building from eight to three. I can take more control over what I'm learning. I'm knowing my teachers even better than I have before because of these connections that I'm able to make and students, parents, families, really just having a lot more involvement in education. That's great. Sounds good to me, John. I, I think good. <laughs> all, Rachel, um, how, about, how about you? Look into yeah, your crystal think, ball. <laughs> um, everything that I want to reiterate, everything that, that John said, and I think uh, mine may be a little bit in the weeds, but it's just hoping that, again, it's a hope. I don't, you know, I see it slowly happening, hopefully. Um, it's just legislation and regulations, right? Like when you're looking at attendance, when you're looking at engagement, right? What, what are the evidence of attendance? What's the evidence of engagement? We're still stuck on traditional ways of viewing that and having to collect that data to, you know, provide, uh, you know, the DOE. But I'm starting to see, you know, more folks are explaining, like, let me show you the evidence. This is how we can show it. Doesn't mean that I'm sitting in front of a Zoom for six hours, which by the way, for a little kindergartner is not the best way to do it, right? But just so I can say that the kid was, is, was present, like, let's talk about how some other ways that we can still show and show evidence that they were present. That's one. The other um, I'm, I'm seeing, and I'm, there's a big hope there too, is just um, teacher certification programs, right? Including more of how do we connect, um, you know, with students, whether it's physically, you know, in front of them or in a virtual environment. So that whole connectiveness and the SEL portions, um, you know, of of learning of interventions and, and triggers and things like that to be incorporated in the teacher um, educational you know, degree programs. So those are, I'm starting to see that and I'm hoping that continues to grow as well as the professional development and training um, after 
you know, you're in the, in the field too, as well. Yeah. And that touches upon one thing, which I, I kept wanting to ask, but I know because we're on, on the hour time uh, limit uh, was the ideas of assessment. Uh, and Rachel, you just kind of touched on that a little bit too. Um, we have a couple more minutes. I'll, I'll, let me just put you on the hot seat for, for one more in terms of where you see that assess those assessment techniques uh, being applied going forward into the future? I mean, are we talking, can we use remote and hybrid learning platforms to finally have digital portfolios? Can we have synchronous, uh, you know, almost like the master's thesis interviews of high school students? Talk a little bit about what your hope when it comes to assessment. I, well, just even PBL, right? A PBL approach, project-based type of learning where you're, you're creating things and, um, and, and also involving the community, right? Where, the, where it's actually experts that are grading your work, not necessarily the, the teacher, right? Um, yeah. That's another, that's one example, right? Uh, also, does it have to be, you know, paper and pencil in the sense, are you submitting always just a document? There's other ways that you can demonstrate your level of knowledge or mastery of standards, which I think now we're having, there are tools out there that are allowing us to be able to, for students to be able to produce that, right? Um, and I think there's going to be, I think there's more of a development of performance-based, you know, type of evidence for students and, and the appropriate rubrics that we can use to evaluate you know, the, the, the level of mastery. So I do see that evolving. Um, the other piece is adaptiveness, right? I'm seeing more the, the ability of being able to assess a student, but having it be adaptive. So we really have a clear understanding, if, you know, if the student is not achieving that level of mastery for that grade level, where are they right now? So that we can use that information to develop their learning path or their learning plan. Excellent. And John, we'll leave you uh, with the last word on on assessment, any thoughts? My first last word is I need Rachel as a lightning rod on all my webinars because she she attracts all the tough questions first, and I get to think about them. Uh, the the way and I and I love Rachel's answer, and it gave me some time to think about this. So here's the way I, I think about it: um, when when we think about high school graduates, we're why are we not at a point as as a society and as a system that instead of measuring graduation rates we're thinking about where did these students go how many where what jobs are they going into uh you know obviously without getting into uh private uh information what jobs are they getting into uh jobs military college what are their salaries what what institutions are they going into uh, there, there's no reason that we can't have good snapshots around all of this you know, a lot of a lot of districts talk about the portrait of the graduate, right? And I think that's great, but I also think that th there can be more done around what do we actually know about these students. Again, I know there's privacy concerns. I also know everybody's uh, just about everybody's posting on Facebook and all these other places. You know, they're, they're giving up all this information all the time. So I'm hopeful that we can get past some of some of these concerns and and start to have a better sense for what's actually happening with our high school graduates. And then in these real world examples and data points, and then you can work back and say, okay, so what does that high school sophomore need to be doing to be on that path? What does the middle school student need to be doing on that path? What does the elementary student need to be doing to be on that path? And that I think leads us towards success for each and every student. Fantastic stuff. Well. I'd like to once again thank our presenters today for a very informative presentation. I'd like to thank all the audience members who were, were out there and, and listening as well. I mean, I think we pulled out, I know I have a number of, of different uh, points here that I wanna follow up with uh, for another webinar going forward on, on this topic. It's certainly something that is, is hugely important for all of us uh, to, to follow. As a reminder, you'll get an email within the next few days that contains a link to this recording along with the slides. Thanks again for participating and have a great day. Thanks, Thank John. You. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you.